when it comes to marketing, marketing enablement, um, I really think about that and sales enablement playing together so closely where the two should be, uh, you know, part of all, you know, uh, they're obviously two different teams, but, you know, being able to break silos is just so extremely key today. Um, marketing enablement, I really think about, okay, how do you, you know, really speak to your consumer? How do you really understand that, you know, today we have prospects that are extremely educated. They, you know, are typically by the time they reach out to a salesperson, having already gone through over 50% of their buyer's journey, typically, especially, you know, if you're talking B2B uh, sales. Um, so that owning that that, that conversation uh, early on for the you know, through the marketing team um, is really uh, you know going to set up the entire team to be that revenue driver. So m marketing enablement and sales enablement, I really kind of put together is hey, we need to educate the consumer. We need to be owning this conversation. We need to be putting out great content that builds trust and credibility as quickly as possible. Um, and and you know working as one team together to do that. Great, thanks, Matt. Karen and Dan, Karen, do you want to go ahead? Sure, you know, one thing I'll add is, you know, the, I think the question asked, um, you know, how do I go about putting together a strategy for this? And I think it really starts with leadership, business owner, um, you know, regardless of, of what role you play in your organization, whether you're part of a market, you own a business or you're one of the leaders in a business, really making sure that you have buy-in and support and a um, clear understanding of what, you know, sales enablement and marketing enablement means, uh, you know, and that is an investment. It's an education process. It's a change management process uh, for some organizations, some maybe not, uh, but getting that alignment and getting that visibility and executive sponsorship is really critical regardless of the size of your organization, um, you know, it, that it needs to come from the top and leaders need to support that uh, structure and that framework. That's the most important part of building a strategy around this. Thanks, Karen. Dan? Yeah, sure. I, the first thing you have to understand is it's not how you want to sell, but it's how your customers want to buy. Um, and, and that's a really important differentiation. Uh, and, and once you figure that out, you need to figure out who your ideal customer profile is. Spend a lot of time on who those buyers are, who influences them. And then, it, as Matt said and alluded to, the, the journey, um, it is kind of a, a sales process to first understand, you know, what is each stage of that, that sales process? Where is the buyer? Um, the ad and you know what are they going to be looking for so you have to you know identify that that entire customer buyer journey the way that they want to buy great thanks dan um let's uh, we have another one in the chat in the um in the chat window for josh and chris now um how can i find innovative ways to find leads what are some things i may not have thought of josh do you want to go ahead yeah, sure. I think to tie it in with what everybody else has been saying already is like there's there's lots of tactics out there. And the main things that most people are doing to generate leads, like we do a lot with online marketing, but we find that when you if you combine the online with the offline, like that's the way to get the most juice out of the turn up. Um, and so like we you know I can talk about a lot of different tactics like you know, LinkedIn ads, and there's a lot of cool things happening there, or Facebook advertising and pay-per-click, and like all the different tactics are great. But like, if you want to talk about like how marketing can really earn its keep, it's the like integrating marketing with the sales team so that the leads you're generating from any of these, you know, newer online sources or other channels are are um, really being treated like they're as valuable as what you're investing to to generate them. You know, so what that really looks like on the ground is like, you know, if you've got an agency or an internal marketing team that's generating leads from any online source. Like you need to make sure you have people that are, are able to follow up with those leads properly and call them on the phone and then have a follow up system on an ongoing basis for those leads. So those are just a, a couple of the things that we think about a lot. Great. Thank you, Josh. Chris. One second. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we've been doing a lot of is 
is when we're dealing with customers and depending on kind of the business that you're in, B2B, B2C, there's a finite amount of opportunity at the bottom of the funnel. So we've gone up the funnel to start educating and engaging at higher levels so that when the time comes for a decision to be made, we're part of that selection set. So really, it becomes content uh, for the website, for marketing materials, everything that connects all the way through. So it's kind of back to what Dan was saying. It's really not what we want to say. It's it's matching, you know, content to intent. What are people looking for? How do we connect with them? And then how do we stay connected and use content as like a, a force multiplier as we go through the process? And what we've been doing that you know, everyone can run paid ads, can do local, organic, whatever, but we're creating more opportunities at the top of the funnel so that at the bottom, there's more opportunities for the salespeople when people are ready to act. Great, thanks, Chris. Karen, did you want to add anything to that? I saw, I saw you kind of like nodding, I didn't know. <laughs> No, I mean, I think you might be muted, Karen. Sorry about that. No, I, I agree with what everyone's saying. I mean, I think that this is this is really key. And I um the the top of the funnel really is is I think a a ideal place for marketing to make an impact and to really help salespeople be successful. So understanding that and, and, you know, whatever your sales process is, um, you know, whatever that top of the funnel is defined as um, marketing can play a very active role there, um, a very successful role and um, and really help sales to be successful in any organization. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, we do have another question here in the chat. Dan, this is for you. In a recent discussion, it was suggested that marketing agencies cannot sufficiently remove bias for being accountable for marketing efforts. It was recommended you have to invest in data and external expertise to hold marketing agencies properly accountable. Is this true and what are your thoughts? <laughs> That's a long question. It was a really long question. Uh, <laughs> Of course, you you do have to um, in, invest in in data, but um, well, I'm gonna have to pause while I answer that, that question. The um, it's more than in, investing in data. You have to understand again. Go go back to the the customer buyer journey in each stage of the sales cycle. You need to look and identify what are the the KPIs that you're looking to get within each one. Um, and and work to those KPIs, and and I get probably all agencies don't manage to the to the KPIs because marketing uh, um, is square sometimes, right? You you have things, but there are clear things that that you can expect from each tactic that you do. So um, yeah, and, and data is only as good as as what you you ha if you have good data. Um, and the KPIs are important, and all agencies probably do um, look at the metrics uh, uh, at each of those sales cycles, and um, you should hold them accountable for it. I hope I answered it quite. That was very complicated. I think you did, and I think Karen wanted to add something as well. Yeah, and I think too, you know, not every agency is right for every problem that you're trying to solve for. So one of the uh, one of the key things that marketing leaders within organizations or business leaders, depending on the size of your organization, need to consider is what is the right agency to help me solve for the problem I'm trying to address. There's no one size fits all, but there's some really specific questions that you can ask an agency to understand. You know where the accountability lies. And um, and how specifically they can help you to reach your objectives. And so I think that it's a hard time, right, for buyers to find the right agency with the right purpose. You know, and do you need to outsource everything? That's another question, right? That we um, that you know we as marketing leaders, you know, are struggling with all the time. What is the right thing to outsource? So these are there's not a one size fits all approach. And as as Dan mentioned. 
really, really um, solid agencies are holding themselves accountable and providing that information and accountability. Uh, data also is a really important part of your plan, though, and you can't, you know, also skip around that. I think it's an and, it's not an either or. Great, right, thanks, Karen. What, what's also interesting okay. is, is, is it a specific set of data that's right or wrong? for any business. There isn't a click-through rate that's expected. There isn't a conversion rate. It's based on brand awareness. It's based on uh, the reputation of the brand, the offers that are happening, the information that's provided. So really, when you're checking those KPIs and managing them, sometimes it's managing against your prior self to your better self, as opposed to comparing to another competitor or a different brand or even a different vertical. So I, as long as you use the third party data as kind of uh, more of a guidance and less of an exact, then I think you're you're in the right, but everyone's going to get slightly different results based on their brand, the offer, the content, everything that wraps around the process. I think another thing that I would add to this is uh, is that the other side of the coin, aside from holding an agency accountable, is how to hold yourself accountable to be a good client of an agency, which maybe isn't talked about as much. And that, you know, that doesn't just mean like be a nice person, uh, although that's great, but it could mean things like, you know, what is, how are you going to measure success and setting that up on the front end and being willing to like hold yourself to that. Also having a, a, a time horizon in mind of this is how long we're going to see this through. Because if, if that, if the answer to that is 3 months or something, you know, really short, like you might as well just not even do it to start for the most part. Uh, and then the other thing I think is to like, let the experts that you hire do the thing that they're an expert at. while also, you know, being collaborative at the same time. But if we talk about like the reasons why companies fail with agencies, I would say 1 of the biggest reasons that we see in our company and with friends of mine that have agencies and hire agencies and such is like trying to trying to control the process too much. And, and just like, the, you know, if you're going to, um, you're going to hire an agency, let them do what they do best. Give them input on the process, the messaging, all that kind of stuff, your personas, all that, but don't try and like, you know, change the way they do things to uh to to modify it for your business, because usually that doesn't work very well in my experience. And Josh, to your point, um what we see a lot of is is quick pivots when results aren't exactly where they want them within a two week, four week window. And it's kind of a process that never gets fully enabled. And what happens is some emergency comes up internal internally. Somebody says something, something changes. So in order to be a, a good customer to an agency, you also need to be smart for yourself and let the process go all the way through or really don't start the journey, as Josh said, because the results are not going to be what you want them to do if you halfway do the process. Yeah, and really from our perspective too, a lot of what uh, Josh was saying, I wanted to echo. I mean, I think that, um, you know, any when it comes to anything around, uh, especially what content driven marketing, which this is, you know, sales enablement is going to, and marketing enablement is going to be, you know, uh, focused on educating the consumer properly. Anything um, that's really content driven like that is a long term strategy. It's something that, your, you, you know, the idea of enablement is how do you educate that buyer down their buyer's journey and down the funnel, and that's something that is going to take time. So, yeah, I, I uh, agree with this panel that hey, you know, if you're if you're going to do this for three months and then say oh nothing's happening like this isn't working, um, either check how you're measuring it or you know maybe you didn't fully commit in the first place. Great, thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Um, we can go to the. We have another one here in the question in the uh, chat. Um, how does understanding the customer's buying journey every single, wait, I'm sorry, let me start over. How does understanding the customer's buying journey empower every single one of marketing enablement's responsibilities to prospective customers? Um, who wants to start? <laughs> Dan, do you want to jump in here? <laughs> Give me all the complicated questions right away. I, 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 I like that. that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess what comes to 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 mind, um, you know, marketing um, often creates assets for sales, 
And, you know, um, sales don't, don't, people don't always understand what has been created and, and where and why to use them. You know, there's a story of a client that we had that we had been creating assets for probably a, a year and everything was locked and loaded into um, Pardot. And, and when we were, ended up being in front of the sales force, um, listening to their wish list of things, um, we could check off and say, well, that's already done. Had you not know they were there? And so, you know, sometimes uh, marketing, when it isn't aligned with sales, um, creates things and, you know, how does that filter down to the salespeople? It, it's, and, and sales training by itself doesn't even handle that, right? It's, um, because they're training at a higher level. And so there's this kind of middle area or this gap that, you know, salespeople aren't armed or trained on what to use and, and how to use it. Hopefully that long answer totally outwashed the question because I don't remember the question exactly. <laughs> Do you want me to read it again? Um, maybe somebody else wants to add something. Let me see. I've got to find this again. Okay. Um, Wait a minute, I lost my chat bubble. I'm so sorry. I would like to jump in there. Okay, yeah, Mary, you go ahead while I'm looking for my window. Yeah, happy to. Dan, to kind of add on top of what you're saying there about, you know, uh, you, creating assets for the salespeople to actually use. That is something that we spent a ton of time trying to figure out on our end as well. Um, just because it, the most frustrating thing can be if you, you know, hire sales, hire marketing people internally or hire an agency, spend all this time creating the content, and then it goes nowhere and it doesn't get used and it's not being leveraged properly. Um, that's something that I think, you know, we try to put the onus on the salespeople and try to hold them accountable by involving them from step one in the content creation process, like having them brainstorm, you know, brainstorm uh, what are those common objections that they're seeing, or maybe even have a marketing person sitting in on sales calls, like shadowing, shadowing those sales calls. We do that often, um, really kind of break, trying to break down those silos between the marketing and sales team. Um, to really identify what are those FAQs, what are those common objections that the marketing per that the salesperson's hearing in the process, so that way the marketing person can then get buy-in from the salesperson saying, "Hey, you're going to actually use this content, right?" And really help understand, like, they're you know that uh, it's going to truly help that prospect move down the funnel um, and kind of deliver on it that way. So, I yeah, that that is uh, absolutely key, and you know that we've seen is involved person in uh, the content creation process. I pick up where uh, where you left off. The, the you touched on a key point about marketing sitting in sales meetings or talking to to salespeople because hearing how they use something or what they were trying to accomplish tells you tells you a lot. You can adjust your um, materials uh, accordingly. Yeah, and that's something, Dan. That you know. Um, at Enterprise Bank and Trust, we try to sit in with all of our sales teams. Um, marketing can't um, be effective if they aren't at the table, hearing what's happening, hearing um, what is happening with our clients, having that firsthand information. But to take it one step further, you know, I think a lot of um, people can get sidetracked by the customer journey, and the buyer journey, and where does it start and where does it stop? And it's very technical. In nature, and I think that you know, um, before getting into all of that, if you're not sophisticated and you want to just start doing some really great marketing to um, start conversations and enable your sales teams to to get out there and and start talking, you know, um, the first thing you can do is talk to your customers and find out what they care about. Um, ask them, you know, what's on their mind, you know, do some surveys. You don't have to have any budget to do these things. You can do them on your own. Even, um, you can get really scrappy with them. There's a lot of shoestring type things that you can do to get started. And you don't have to start with a, um, sophisticated process. Um, it takes time. So test and learn and, and just get out there and start doing it. Great. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed, Karen, at how uh, how not utilized the sales teams are for information. How they people don't go out to their clients. They just 
gather up the information themselves. So we've got all this rich data right in front of to utilize for the marketing efforts. And many teams just completely miss it or ignore it. So you're right, they're customers, your and Matt, your employees, they're they're huge. Your salespeople are for collecting that data and building that model. And it doesn't have to overwhelm you. Sorry, I think I was muted here. Thanks, Chris. Um, we have another question here in chat. How are you incorporating growth roles? People focused on firm growth through collaboration between marketing, sales, HR, IT, and finance into your departments. Um, Karen, <laughs> Karen's nodding her head. Yeah, this is you know another um, another one that I think uh, a lot of our answers start with um, leadership and alignment, right? So making sure that um, whether it's the president of your company, the CEO, your um, chief revenue officer, whoever it is that you are, um, you know, who's leading these efforts really has to be an ambassador for these teams working together. One thing I tell my team a lot is, you know, um, marketing and technology are now intersecting. Um, we have to get really smart about technology for us to be effective modern marketers, right? Um, and you at least need to know um, enough, right, to be dangerous. Uh, and and so, you know, one of those things that, that we're doing is constantly educating ourselves so that we're doing our part in this mix. And um, that's very important to me and to our team is getting that education, keeping our skills up to date. But on the on the flip side, that makes us better partners for our IT, our HR, finance, um, you know, to have the conversations around efficiency, around um, how do we make best use of our technology? How do we use what we have? The answer is not always buy. The answer sometimes is let's use what we have. Um, a lot of times it is actually. So um, getting on the same page as those teams meeting on an ongoing basis, being at the table and being the partner that we need to be um, is really, really important. But again, just full circle back, it starts at the top with your leadership saying this is important and, and we all need to be aligned. I think that one of the things that I see a lot on this um, is that when, for, if we're talking about a growth role of any sort, so you're going to you're, you're basically talking about putting a a new butt in a new seat that is responsible for some sort of growth in the company is being really clear up front with this new hire about like, here is the here are the KPIs for how we're going to measure your performance in this role and here's what we expect to get out of it because what happens uh, in my in my experience more times than not what happens is that you put somebody in a new role that in it has been you've, you've hypothesized how if we put somebody in this position, they will do X, Y, and Z, and it will help our company grow. And then you look a year later, your the PNL is still the same, but your overhead has increased. And so uh, I think it's important to be really clear and upfront with people about that. And so that you also know, how do we know if this person's going to succeed in this role? You know, um, I had a client that hired a CMO without that kind of clarity. And then uh, six months later, parted ways with that person, and it was a painful process for everybody. And they had really wished that they had been clear up front that, like, we're not just hiring a CMO because we just want to grow, but like, let's be clear about what the expectation, how much growth needs to happen for this person to ju to justify their existence here at our company. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything? Chris, do you have anything to add to that? We can go to the next question. Okay, um, next question. Do agencies have the ability to incorporate financial, operational, or cross department data to optimize measurable outcomes from marketing enablement? What are the best methods? Oh, my chat window is moving. What are the best methods for using marketing enablement KPIs when communicating with a board of directors? Let's go to Karen. You want to start with this? Dan looks like I'm getting the hard ones now. Yeah, 
So, um, so I'll handle the second part of that question, and then I'll let I'll kick the agency one to one of one of you agency folks. How's that sound? Um, so, you, you know, the second part of that, what are the best ways or the best methods for using marketing enablement KPIs when communicating with the board of directors? You know, this is something that, um, you know, that in every role I've ever been in has been a huge topic of conversation. Um, and again, this is really important for education purposes. And I think that um, working with your leadership team, um, marketing leaders really need to establish and understand what are the key performance indicators that these these board the board is um, interested in and cares about? And so that's a conversation, right? That's a discussion. What do you want to see? And I think Josh, you you hit the nail on the head. Um, understanding what you're being held accountable for is really important and critical for a marketing leader's success. Um, you know, the modern day marketer is uh, should be held accountable for more than makes us look pretty. And, um, you know, so how do you measure that impact and, and what are the, um, the stats around that that you're going to be looking at and very closely? Um, the board of directors has vested interest, right, in understanding and knowing how that performance is being achieved. Consistent application over time, same KPIs, you should see upward trend. Um, and some of these are leading indicators um, for the first few, you know, months, years, whatever it is. But then you hope to see those lagging indicators following um, and, you know, establishing those together is really uh, is really that first step um, to tracking and monitoring. And so I'll, I'll let one of you answer the agency question. I'll, I'll go for the first part, which was you do agencies have the ability to incorporate financial operational cross department data. Um, some I'd say most don't. Um, you know, the, the ones that, that are focused on, you know, returning an investment, um, probably do. Um, and even when, when we do, um, we don't always have access to the board. And so I, I think often it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's worthwhile to separate some of the operational portion, um, you know, with, with some companies that can. Um, talk to the board level. We don't always get as an agency. Um, we hope to always be involved with the executive team. Um, but sometimes we're involved at the head of sales or head of marketing level and don't get access to the, even the CEO, much less the, the board. However, we as agencies should always be thinking about. Um, how to uh, position that and, and I think a lot of us have the ability, but I would say no, most most don't have it. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, so I have another question here. I'm starting my marketing efforts from scratch. Where should I start? I think everybody could weigh in here. <laughs> Matt, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. There, uh, it's a very, it's a very, very broad question. But I would say, from my, uh, from my, our perspective, kind of how we view the, the you know, uh, marketing landscape period. Um, no matter what you do, great a great message and great content, you know, uh, backing up that message is you know the the essence of marketing. So I think you know you can get even further back into building personas, and I think Spo can speak to that a bit, and a few other people can speak to that more effectively than than I can on the call. From a content perspective, when you understand that persona and who you're speaking to and what they really care about. Going through and really creating a documented content strategy is where I recommend that that first step uh, start when it you know when when you are going to commit to content marketing in any way, um, and that's because even if you have a small team, um, as you grow that team or as you try to justify why your organization is spending resources on creating content, you need to have some place you can point back to to say you know here's who we're speaking to. Uh, what they're they're reading online. Um, here's the, the kind of uh, all those things, um, you know, across the team. And as you hire more and more people, um, that documented content strategy is really kind of our north star when it comes to content marketing specifically. So um, I'll let somebody else speak to maybe persona building and things like that. But who wants to speak to that? Here. Next, but this is probably a good topic for all of us. So I, I do pick up where Matt said is you haven't told your story until someone else can tell it. 
um, which uh, the storytelling aspect is, is really important. Um, you know, backing up just a little bit, they, they, you need to know who you're telling it to. So again, it goes back to that, who is your um, target buyer? And so if you had a place to start, you know, um, who who is that buyer? And, and if you haven't done any marketing, you know, a place that I like to say to start is, is something I call the follow the money trail, which is, you know, analyze your um, customers, your best customers um, right now. Um, see what kind of attributes, how did they come to you? What were they asking for? You know, um, and so you could start by analyzing your, your current customer base and finding the ideal customer within that. Great, thanks, Dan. We have another question here. Um, what is your best advice for trying to influence leadership to find value and utilize marketing? Karen, do you wanna take that? Sure, happy to. Um, you know, the great question, and you've heard me talk a lot about um, leadership and how important it is to have leadership support to, to build a sales and marketing culture. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, there's a saying, and I, I don't know who said this, but um, it's one of my favorites, um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Right, you know, you can have the best strategy in the world, and if you don't have the right culture for that strategy, nothing is going to take off. And so, um, you know, changing culture takes time. I've learned that the hard ways many, many times, and you know, the um, and so small incremental steps forward, um, beginning with um, your leaders is a really important way to start. Um, there's a lot of really great, um, you know, information, statistics. If you want to message me offline, whoever's question this is, I'm happy to share, you know, some return on investment general, um, you know, information that you can use to show the value that marketing can play, um, you know, and that strategic marketing plays in the health and competitiveness of a growing organization. Uh, and I think that um, one other piece of advice I would give, you know, uh, our leaders are very passionate at Enterprise Bank and Trust about sales and marketing. They're passionate about alignment. They're passionate about supporting those teams. And, um, and we have a culture, therefore, that, that embraces it. So um, that is really an, an important recipe for success. Taking that one step further, though, I would say, um, you know, in your organization, having the right um, people at the table, the right stakeholders at the table, you know, or that might be whatever your culture is, bringing those people in. Um, and Missouri, in particular, is the show me state. That's advice I got really early on in my career show, don't tell, show them what marketing can do and what, what um, impact it has by just, you know, getting stuff done and making that impact. Um, if you're a marketing leader, um, no time like the present. And, a, you know, to Matt's point, a great place to start is content. Um, so that's always going to make your sales teams happy and they'll always use it. So uh, that's, that's a great place to start. I think if I can add something to that, that like uh, the the part, the last part that Karen was saying about the the show me state stuff is like if you're able to demonstrate the ROI of the work that you're doing, then it certainly makes the case a lot easier, and that you don't have to just hope that the leadership in your company buys into this vague concept that if we do these things, trust us that maybe somehow it'll work. We won't ever really know, but you know, it's we got to do something. You know, so like there's so many opportunities now, especially with online to really have your marketing take more of like a, a direct response marketing type of approach where you're able to much more tangibly measure the results. So like if you work with a company like Matt's, you're driving more traffic to your website. Well, then you can retarget that traffic and drive them into sales appointments and much more easily measure what is the value of the content marketing that you're doing? What's the value of the SEO investment that you've made? And then, you know, usually in a pretty short amount of time, you can quantify like the, the cost to get somebody to the top of the funnel all the way down to the bottom of the funnel. 
And then if your sales team has any experience, you should be able to justify some sort of an ROI calculation based off of that. And uh, in my experience, maybe this is just because this is the way we talk to all of our clients about about this stuff. Is, but if you're ROI focused and you can show the numbers on it, uh, it's a lot easier to get by in. And if none of that works, electric shocks. Um, <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing, and to Josh and Karen's points, uh, what we do quite often is we use search as a proxy for overall intent. And we can actually see how much opportunity is out in the marketplace. And then we can figure out what the client currently is capturing, how much of that opportunity. And then we just roll out models based on conversion rates they have. And what if we could incrementally gain different parts of that opportunity that they're not touching. So early on, um, since we can't show them an ROI today, what we can show them is that there's this much opportunity and we're capturing or engaging with this percentage of it. Would we like to incrementally grow that because the percentage we're engaging with is converting at this rate. Um, there's a chance that if we could grow that, that we could get some conversions from that. So we basically build a what if model uh, using all the data available. So it's not really us telling anyone that they should do marketing. It's saying this is out there. Would you like to connect with these people or not? That's great. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Josh. Um, next question we have. For Josh, how can a platform like LinkedIn help me generate leads? A lot of people are in front of LinkedIn now because of COVID. I feel like there's more online trying to do business. So I guess that's that's part of my personal question as well as this chat question. <laughs> yeah, well, LinkedIn released some stats over the last few months showing just the, like record levels of engagement on their platform because more people are but working at home, have more idle time on their hands, and they're spending more time on LinkedIn. Um, all sorts of reasons. But yeah, people are sending more messages, they're connecting with more people, they're reading more content on LinkedIn. So like all of those are ways of you know potentially tapping into LinkedIn to generate leads. If your customers are on LinkedIn and paying attention to LinkedIn, which most for most of us, especially if you're B2B, um, they they are. And so I mean it usually falls within one of two buckets. It's do you want your you're you, either yourself if you're in a smaller business or your sales team if you have an SDR team if you've got people on your team that are prospecting do you want them to be using organic LinkedIn strategies to be connecting with potential prospects and building relationships with them and I the, I stress the building relationships part because that is really really key LinkedIn is overrun with sales pitches so if your sales strategy on LinkedIn is let's get our our reps to connect with prospects and send them a sales pitch it's, a, I believe, a huge waste of time. Um, but if you can develop a unique strategy to allow them to build relationships with people, you can get a much higher response rate. Never 100%, but much better than the uh, the sales pitch strategy. And then the uh, the other thing that's really exploding on LinkedIn right now is advertising. So you know, if you're if you're looking to invest in other uh, ad channels. Whether it's to drive more people to content, get people to sign up for webinars, to drive people directly into sales appointments, uh, all sorts of cool ways that, that companies are using LinkedIn ads right now. To Sorry, Josh's myself. To ahead, Josh, point, what's interesting to us, we're seeing the, the seismic shift in Google and Facebook targeting. Uh, they're minimizing some of our available targeting channels. So LinkedIn starts to become very desirable because we can get to certain markets that we're unable to get to anymore in Facebook or uh, Google based on updates. So it's really interesting how the, the landscape's evolving and which channels allow us uh, easier connecting to our target audience. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, we have another question here. Um, there was an opening quote, marketing should make you money, not cost you money. Do you feel housing internal communication activities within the marketing department is a mistake as it could lead to an internal brand that goes against this quote? Karen, I think you had something to add here. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I've seen this done both ways. You know, sometimes internal communications is in marketing and sometimes it's in HR or sometimes it's in corp com that's separate from marketing. And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, it, culture is a huge um, is a huge question. I would ask, what is your culture, and um, and can you keep all of your communications aligned? Communication is. I would just add that it can be. Um, I think what's most important is is you know how does your business operate and can you stay aligned? Great, thanks, Karen. You broke up a little bit in the middle. Could you? I I don't want to ask you to repeat the whole thing, but just the last chunk. Sure. Yeah, no, the last chunk I, I again would just say, um, you know, internal communications is extremely important and a lot can be said about the value that brings to making a, a company money. Uh, we won't go into that, but I would just say that it needs to be aligned um, with all of your messages. So if you can have it, um, you know, in a different department and stay, stay aligned with your overall marketing message, that's what's really important. Not where it sits, you know. Great, thank you. Perfect. Um, we have another one, Chris. How can I improve my website to get moved up in an organic search on Google? Is that something you can give advice to? Sure. <laughs> Depends what you're trying to move up for. Um, it, what's interesting is. Um, Kind of, like I said before, uh, you know, searching what people are looking for is kind of the content that you've got to map. I think Matt will attest to this is you really have to have good content that aligns with it. So in our world, um, we start with uh, there's three pillars for us. There's technology, content and authority. The technology we can fix. It can be a, a great CMS that loads fast, mobile friendly, indexable content. Then we have to have relevant content. We can't speak at the audience. We have to speak with them. We have to answer their questions. And the way that that we're going to do that is analyze what Karen had said before, analyze what salespeople, what customers are asking for, and make sure we have all that content there. And then the last part of that, generally what happens, especially on a newer website, um, there isn't much authority. And authority is the quantity and quality of uh, websites that link to your website. So ultimately, if you've got great content, the theory goes people will link to it. Uh, if you have resources, they'll link to it. So what happens is you have to do an outreach effort to get people to want to know about your content, to link to it, to share it, to be interested. And that's really how you're gonna rank better. But it doesn't matter if you have all the links in the world if you don't have good content. It doesn't matter if you have all the links in the world and your website's not sound. So if you want to move up, it's not just a, a yes or no question. It's not just a simple answer. It's multiple components. But as you're thinking about that, you really need to think about this whole uh, sales enablement process because it's going to rely a lot on content. So just need to think more holistically and then not so siloed about just getting one keyword to rank somewhere that you want it to rank. Yeah, to kind of add in what uh, there on the content piece as well, um, really, I mean, I guess the intent of any search engine is to give, give the searcher the best experience possible. And that means answering their question as quickly as possible and giving them the best content that that you know they're they're looking for uh, to answer that question. So, um, really, if you can think about it through that lens and be the brand that is putting out content that that answers that question and puts out the best content um, to really get home what what uh, you know what that 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 person is searching for. Um, that's kind of how the lens we try to think about it. You think through 
very specific kind of longer tail keyword opportunities that are, you know, a very specific question that you guys can, can uh, you know, are the, the best answer for that you can really speak to with authority. Um, you know, when it comes to, to coming through with a topic strategy, we kind of think through that lens as well. So, yeah, like Chris said, content's the fuel for all of this. It's about understanding, you know, what is your prospect searching for? How can you address that in the best way possible? And then, you know, think through specific strategy on where that content will live, whether it's on your site or on another site and trying to get a link back. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, we have another one here for Karen, Matt, and Dan. How does marketing enablement better support salespeople in advancing and closing sales? And if you have any specifics on that. Karen, and then maybe Matt and Dan can weigh in as well. Sure, so I think, you know, again, going back to the, to the definition of marketing enablement, uh, empowering your marketing teams to um, and aligning them with sales is first and foremost, uh, and making sure that they feel accountable um, to that vision and mission. And one of the things that I'll um, I'll just say for anybody in marketing, you know, it's so important that you feel passionate and love sales um, to be successful as a as a marketer because um, that really is the true north, right? Of what we're trying to do, we're trying to grow the business, um, and and caring deeply about that, feeling passionate about that is is pretty critical. So I would look for that in your marketing team if um, if that's the role you want them to play. I would also say that um, you know going back to accountability, making sure that you are tracking, measuring, and, and showing those results is really critical. Uh, for example, um, however you define your marketing qualified leads, um, holding them accountable to how many leads they're contributing, setting those, um, those quotas for your marketing team to bring in so that they have an actual benchmark um, that they can be measured against. Um, understanding what that looks like is really important in terms of um, that process. The other thing that I would say is really important, and I, I, I feel certain that Matt will have something to say about this, um, measuring your content is really important too. And understanding um, how your content is performing is critical. So for example, if you create a white paper and get it out there and you get a ton of activity around it, but none of them are your buyers, that should tell you something. So you really need to look at who's interacting with your content. Are they the right people? Are they the people that you want to be interacting with? Um, activity for the sake of activity is not productive. Um, quality activity is important in understanding and defining what that qual quality looks like and then really having the right technology or technology partner, as everyone here is talking about, that allows you to measure. Um, I'll pick up from here. It, it goes back to, we talked about the customer buyer journey and it really are kind of three um, main areas, awareness, consideration, and decision. And and when Matt picks up, I, I may he'll, he'll pick up where I leave off, but you, you need to understand where your buyer is and what kind of content they need to make to move on to the next stage. So in awareness, they're looking um, at you, or you, they have a pain, they're looking to see if you can solve that pain. You know, when they get into consideration, they're looking, you know, to compare you um, against other, other solutions possibly, or whether you'd be a fit. And so, goes back to something I said, the right um, content at the, the right stage of, of um, between awareness consideration, but even each stage of the sales cycle. Yeah, and just to piggyback off what um, Dan said there too, I, I would add two things. I'd say um, content, uh, whenever we're, we're helping uh, help, you know, coach people on what all it can be used for within the sales process, um, typically, it's either overcoming objections, like Karen said, with, you know, using a, you know, whether it be gated content, like a white paper or, um, you know, uh, something data driven, uh, you know, a study you can share, you know, things like that, that you can educate the consumer on, um, you know, what, one bucket would be overcoming objections. Another piece is really this content should arm your champions as well. 
because a lot of times whoever you're selling into at your or um prospective buyer they're going to have to get another i think today it's it's like seven point something uh seven point five or you know whatever it might be a number of people involved um on average in the the buying process now um i know challenge your buyer is a book that um uh, just you know had uh you know i'd recommend reading that to to kind of see um, you know the full picture behind enterprise sales and organizational sales like that but creating great content to arm your champions for them to get those other seven and a half people or those other six and a half people on board with them and their vision, um, you know, help help your champion sell your vision internally once they're bought in. Um, so the content should not only convince them, but also help them get their team on board with a, a specific buying decision. Great. Thank you, Matt. Here's another question in the chat window. Um, how does marketing get salespeople to trust their intentions and to deliver on what salespeople actually want, not what marketing thinks they should have. Otherwise, the salespeople will never use the material marketing provides. Fun statistic, a shocking 80% of marketing created collateral designed for salespeople are never actually used by salespeople. <laughs> um, everyone, everyone weigh in here. <laughs> Deanne, do you wanna start? Sure. I, the uh, salespeople and and a you you have to identify with them. You know you have to listen um, to what they're doing and what they need, and and identify with them. So that's basic relationship um, driven. You don't push something down somebody. You have to understand the sales lingo. You have to understand what a salesperson is going to do with something, and you have to ask uh, a lot of questions. Otherwise, you you really can't build any credibility on there. And and I guess you know um, I'll let somebody pick up from there. But you got to follow through. Um, with what you've um, identified. Yeah, and I think kind of um, strategic. Too, uh, oh. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Go ahead. You sure? Okay. All right, that works. Uh, yeah, just to kind of uh, uh, go off what Dan was saying there as well, I think strategically, um, having people, I know I mentioned having the salespeople in on, uh, or marketing people in on uh, sales conversations and sales meetings. I mean, we, we personally have them, have salespeople involved with the marketing team in brainstorming topics and, you know, in a Slack message where if they get off a great call, they say, hey, I've answered this objection this way and it really you know, resonated well. You know, strategically having a collaborative between the sales and marketing team and having them involved day one um, is, you know, how we execute on it ourselves. Um, and then tactically, um, having a specific uh, place that, that salespeople can go to, like we actually have a bank of content that we use. It's just a, anything as simple as just a, you know, a Google sheet that you can share across your team where, you know, if you can bucket and say, here, you know, uh, if we need to justify ROI, here are articles that help you do that. If we need to justify, um, you, know, uh, you know, really anything else within that, uh, that particular uh, sales conversation, here are those links to the articles that we're creating and putting out there to, to help you do that. Um, tactically having a specific place to, to be able to share amongst the team, um, you know, is how we manage it across multiple salespeople, multiple marketing people, and that's worked pretty well. Honestly, Matt, that's exactly where I was going. It was really just making sure that you had the sales team in on the front end because they're not going to necessarily always buy into something that they weren't involved in. So it becomes just something handed to them as a, instead of something they participated in. And a lot of them have great information and insights into the customers that will help the marketing team. So it's breaking the silos again and making sure everyone's communicating. And I muted. <laughs> um, okay, so we're almost at time. Dan, do you want to wrap up here with a couple of closing remarks? So there was a lot of really good questions, and and I, I think um, you know I think kind of summarizing is that marketing and sales really have to be aligned to get an ROI, and that it starts um, from the top. 
um, and it starts by um, including everyone in the, the process um, and it considers the ideal customer profile and it considers the entire customer journey from lead generation, which we talked about to, you know, convert depending on what stage they're in and even beyond when they become a, a customer. And if you don't, um, if you don't know who your best customer is and you, you don't know how your, your sales team is approaching things, then, um, you know, you, you aren't going to get to the, the end goal of more sales. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. It's been an honor to be your moderator today. And we'll see you all next time, August 25th. We have back to back sessions. So look us all up. If you have any questions, um, feel free to connect and send us a message. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thanks.